we'll go ahead and get started and Matthew's up first. All right, thanks, Jordan. Um, so, hello everybody and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt Romanko. I am a water quality associate with OSU Extension. Um, when we started putting this webinar series together, we came up with several topics that we wanted to discuss or invite speakers in to discuss related to water quality in our region. Now, while each of the previous segments from the series covered a specific issue or topic, we wanted to end the series by taking a little bit of a step back and have a segment dedicated to a kind of higher level overview of some different topics related to water quality in the Western Lake Erie Basin. And to me, a natural place to start in a high level overview around this topic is the history of the region. So the title of this presentation is The History of Farmland in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Uh, following my presentation, Bridget will give an overview of Lake Erie limnology and current water quality conditions. And then Bowden will finish us up uh, talking about different management strategies moving forward. So just to start off, I wanna give a quick overview of what my talk will cover today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about um, the geology of farmland uh, in our region, starting off with ancient geology and then talking more about uh, the recent geology that left us with the current landscape that we have today. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different soils that we have in our state, how they were formed and how we classify them. And then I'm gonna finish up talking about the impact that humans have had on our landscape and the effect that that has had on water quality in the basin. So Northwest Ohio hasn't always been the fertile farmland that we all know today. Uh, if we went back in time around 420 million years, Northwest Ohio was actually a warm shallow marine environment that sat around 20 degrees latitude south of the equator. We can deduce what type of environment existed at that time by looking at the geologic deposits that exist in our region. This is a generalized paleogeographic map of the region showing the distribution of mainly carbonate deposits that form uh, our bedrock here in Ohio. Over millions of years, tectonic forces moved that carbonate structure to its current position here 41 degrees north of the equator. Along the way, continental scale collisions of land masses led to the formation of the Appalachian mountain chain along the East Coast. And those same forces were also responsible for the uplift of the Cincinnati Arch that makes up the bedrock across of much of Western Ohio. And here you can see another paleogeographic model of what the region is thought to have looked like at the time when this was all going on. And you can really start to get an idea of how these forces squeezed the rock layers that existed here. This generalized graphic on the top left does a really good job explaining exactly what happened here. Uh, as the two plates collided together, building those mountains off to the east, the same forces warped the bedrock in this foreland basin area, creating a four deep area of subsidence, a four bulge area of uplift, and a back bulge basin area. And these regions correspond to the Appalachian Basin down there in the south southeast corner of the state, the Cincinnati Arch on which the Bell Fountain outlier is depicted on this cross section, and then the Michigan Basin up there in the far northwest corner of the state. So over many more millions of years, clastic sediments such as shale and sandstone eroded from the Appalachian Mountains off to the east and filled that four deep region forming the Allegheny Plateau, which covers much of eastern Ohio. This topographic feature served as a barrier to advancing glacial ice, ice sheets much later in the Quaternary period. And this led to the formation of two fundamentally different physiographic regions across the state. So we have a glaciated region and an unglaciated region. Now, if you look at the cross section here on the bottom, you can see a thin layer of yellow that covers all of the bedrock from A up in the Northwest all the way southeast across the state until it hits that glacial margin, which is represented on the map as a blue line. Now that thin layer of yellow represents the quaternary age glacial deposits that sit on top of the older bedrock units below. 
This relatively young thin layer of glacial sediments is what makes up the parent material for all of the soils we have to farm here in the Western Lake Erie Basin today. The most recent glacial episodes spanned a period from around 10 to 25,000 years ago. Uh, and then within each glacial period, there were smaller patterns of glacial advance and retreat that occurred on much shorter time periods. As the ice sheets retreated, glacial lakes would form from meltwater on the margins of those glaciers. Here you can see around 14,000 years ago, the boundary of glacial Lake Maumee extended much further inland than where the present coast of Lake Erie is today. You can keep going through time and see that around 13,000 years ago, another glacial lake shore can be distinguished known as glacial Lake Whitlesey. And then somewhere in the range from five to 10,000 years ago, we started to see Lake Erie take a more familiar form to what we know today as those ice sheets continued to retreat and a more stable drainage network was established over the region. These variable glacial lake stages that existed in Northwest Ohio over that period played a very important role in the development of the soils we have in our region. Wave action in aqueous environments like those in glacial lakes leads to a natural sorting of sediment particles based on their grain size. Coarse sands are deposited in higher energy beach zones because they're the largest and they weigh the most. And then as you move further out into deeper water, uh, the energy level becomes lower and lower, allowing progressively finer sediments to fall out of suspension. Eventually then when you're out into that really deep water, the wave energy from the surface is able to be dispersed enough through that water column that the finest silt and clay sized particles can finally fall out of suspension. And if you look at this glacial map of Ohio, you can see evidence of a lot of the things that I just mentioned. So that glacial margin where the ice sheets were stopped by the topography of the Allegheny Plateau, it's clearly defined. There are successive ages of glacial periods that are evident by the older deposits found down there in Southwest and Central Ohio. These deposits are classified as Illinoisan and pre-Illinoisan, and they're 130,000 and 300,000 plus years old respectively. And those are those deposits shown in orange and gold and brown here on this map. Uh, the, the most recent glacial period, the Wisconsin in, had several smaller cycles of advance and retreat over the course of its life, evident by the repetitive series of ridge moraines shown throughout western Ohio in that green color. Another really neat feature that you can tell by looking at this map is that that topographic high point um, sitting on top of the Cincinnati Arch over there in Bell Fountain uh, was actually enough of an impediment to the ice sheets as they moved through that they formed kind of a lobe on each side of that uh, high point as they advanced. And you can kind of see that looking at the deposits on this map. Uh, the final point here, I guess we can look at is, uh, we can see all of those glacial lake deposits and that wave planed ground moraine up there in Northwest Ohio that cover, up, uh, that cover much of the Western Lake Erie Basin. Now you'll notice some similarities to this glacial map of Ohio when you look at the soil regions map of Ohio. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, our soils formed from those glacial deposits as they weathered over the thousands of years since they were deposited. The soils are classified using a hierarchical system based on the dominant soil forming factors at a particular location. So this system starts out more general and then it gets more specific as you move down through the hierarchy into those smaller units. So the hierarchy goes order, suborder, great group, subgroup, family, and series, with orders being the largest in the most general group, and then series are the smallest in the most specific group. The map that you see here was developed by analyzing soil surveys that have been conducted since the early 1900s. By grouping associations of soil series that are common in an area, they were able to create the soil regions map. Uh, soil series are commonly named after the locations where they are found, or possibly a city or a town that's nearby. So if somebody tells you uh, that they're farming on a polluting soil, for example, you can determine right away a general location in the state where they farm and know a little bit about what is common for soils in that series due to the different environmental processes that went into creating that soil. So we know that uh, polluting and other soils in region one formed from glacial lake deposits and that the area is characterized by high clay content and low slopes. 
Uh, as time and technology progress, we continue to delineate smaller and smaller soil units based on the most recent data that we have available. So this is an example of a soil report created from the USDA NRCS's web soil survey that utilizes the SWERGO database. Uh, each map unit may have one to three major components as well as some minor components associated with it. For example, here uh, we have this Fitchville silt loam, which is symbolized FC, and it has two components, A and B, which both indicate a different range of slope values for each of those respective areas. So when they were doing these soil survey, surveys around the counties here in Ohio, they sent a bunch of samples to the labs and had them analyzed for all sorts of different properties. So with this data set, you can get an estimated value for what a reasonable measure might be for a number of different parameters across most of the different soil units you might find on your farm. So here I have maps for calcium carbonate, cation exchange capacity, and organic matter. Uh, then there is also a legend in the report that has uh, values associated with the units that you see here. Now, they're not going to be as accurate if you were to go out and sample each of these fields and send them to the lab yourself, but this can give you a really good idea of what is common for that type of soil. So there's really probably a lot more that we could uh, talk about as far as the history of soils. But for now, I want to transition to the last segment here and talk about the impacts humans have had on our landscape here in the Western Lake Erie Basin and what that has meant for our soil and water in the region. So the presence of humans in this region can be traced back thousands of years. Uh, archaeological evidence that was found in Medina and Stark counties actually indicate that Native Americans were present in this region as far back as 10 to 14,000 years ago. Other old cultures such as the Adena, Hopewell, and Fort Ancient are also known to have inhabited this region from 1000 BCE up until 1000 CE. Uh, and then for a period of time in the 1600s, the Iroquois were the dominant culture in Ohio. Um, but then by the 1700s, other tribes like the Delaware, Shawnee, Ottawa, Wyandotte, and Miami, as well as numerous other small tribes called Ohio home. Through the late uh, 1600s and early 1700s, European settlers uh, and explorers really began moving into the region and setting up trading posts to take advantage of the lucrative fur trading that existed in this area. Now, tensions rose between the French and British and different Native American tribes sided with each side during the French Indian War from 1754 to 1763. In the end, the British came out on top and laid claim to the Ohio region. However, the victory was short-lived because the nation was thrown back into war from 1775 to 1783, when the American colonists fought for their independence from Britain during the American Revolutionary War. Now, after the war was over, the newly formed US government enacted the Northwest Ordinance, which formed some unorganized territory north west of the Ohio River into the nation's first organized incorporated territory. And then in 1788, General Rufus Putnam led a group of explorers to Marietta to establish the first permanent settlement in this new territory. So early settlement um, was really fraught with violence as the new settlers pushed into the Native American territory. Um, but by 1795, many of the tribes were either forcefully dealt with or willingly agreed to the new settlers uh, and, and the Treaty of Greenville was signed, which redefined the boundaries, at least temporarily, for those indigenous tribes and American settlers. And you can see here on the map where that line existed. The land up to the north was reservation land set aside for Native American tribes to relocate to. Uh, then in 1803, Ohio became the 17th state to join the Union. And from then on, settlers began pushing into Ohio and transforming the landscape along the way. Now, Ohio used to look quite a bit different than what it looks like today. Some estimates say that the state was previously covered by up to 95% forests. And then throughout the 1800s, those forests were cut down to sell timber and make way for new agricultural land as settlers moved into the area. The old forest soils that existed here were very fertile and made good farmland once the trees were cleared. Now, Early American settlers were persistent and they continued to expand further and further up into Northwest Ohio throughout the mid 1800s. 
uh, when they got into uh, the northwest corner of the state, their progress really slowed down because they ran into the Great Black Swamp. This low-lying, poorly drained land, which is a remnant of the glacial history of the region, as I previously discussed, made it almost impossible uh, to travel from the east up into the northwest corner of the state and beyond without having to take a massive detour south around that, that big swamp. So settlers devised a plan to construct a road that would cut straight through the swamp and allow, allow travel from Fremont up there to the Maumee River area in Perrysburg. So construction of the Maumee and Western Reserve Road led to the draining of the first sections of the Black Swamp and as workers installed culverts and ditches to allow water to drain under the road. Now, after the swamp was drained and the trees were removed from the land, it didn't take a long time for people to realize how rich the soil was in that old swamp land, which inevitably led to the draining of the rest of the swamp and cutting down of the rest of the trees so settlers could take advantage of this natural resource. So here you can see two railroad maps from Northwest Ohio, one from 1860, another is 26 years later in 1886. And this really helps illustrate just how fast this part of the state changed over a pretty short, short period of time um, as that land was settled. Now, through the process of settling Ohio, we have destroyed about 90% of the naturally occurring wetlands and forests that once existed in the state. And you can think about the tremendous amount of work that went into doing this. Uh, workers at this time also dug ditches and installed clay tiles and fields, in many cases by hand, in order to make the land suitable for agriculture. So a whole lot of work went into transforming the Western Lake Erie Basin into what it is today. Uh, the pictures that I have up here show just what some of those methods that early settlers would have used to, to do this work. And what did we get out of it? Well, according to the Ohio Farm Service Agency, food and agriculture contribute $124 billion to Ohio's economy, and farming employs one out of every eight Ohioans. So that means agriculture is one of the largest industries, if not the largest industry in Ohio. Uh, agriculture has sustained Ohioans throughout modern history, and really to make sure it continues to sustain us into the future, we need to make sure that we are protecting the natural resources that make farming possible. So what effect has all of this change had on our soil and water? Well, if we look at some examples from long-term data collected in similar cropping systems throughout other parts of the Midwest, we see a consistent decrease in soil organic carbon in every one of these examples. Northwest Ohio, much like a lot of the other Midwest areas, has really relatively high organic uh, soil uh, organic matter in the soil due to the thick forests that once covered the region. Forest soils like we have here in the Western Lake Erie Basin were typically three and a half to four percent soil organic matter. Today, organic matter is generally lower on our agricultural, uh, agricultural soils due to successive years of crop production and tillage. The example on the right here shows how 17 years in a soybean monoculture changed the soil structure of a forest soil that was originally 4.3% organic matter to an agricultural soil that was only 1.6% soil organic matter. So you can notice some, some huge differences immediately, like the forest soil is much darker and it has more clumps or aggregates than the agricultural soil. And when these soils are placed in water, you can see how much better the forest soils hold together compared to those agricultural soils. So from this example, you can really get a sense that the transition from forest to agriculture in the Western Lake Erie Basin has also been associated with the degradation of our soils that has increased the risk of sediment transport into the basin. So there are a lot of different benefits associated with increased organic matter, both agronomically and environmentally. Um, better aeration and tilth associated with higher organic matter soils tends to have less crusting and better infiltration. The formation of aggregates and pore spaces within the soil matrix creates more resilient soils with potential for increased uh, microbial biodiversity, which in turn can increase nutrient cycling and retention which can then have an impact on crop yields and economic return on investment. 
Here you can see some work that was done by Hudson in 1994 that shows how available water content in soil increases as the percent soil organic matter increases in three different soil types. So the effect of cutting down the forests that covered the region has really been putting us into a situation where we're not replenishing that organic matter in the soil and we're slowly losing many of the benefits that our native soils once offered. Uh, at the same time, the replacement of what was once the largest natural wetland in the state with a system of tile drains and ditches has further reduced the natural ability of our ecosystem to deal with the erosion slash nutrient loading problem that we face today. Uh, wetlands are beneficial to the environment in several ways. The picture here shows several of these benefits. So wetlands can dissipate stream energy for flood control. They can act as sediment traps, reducing the total particulate sediment load that uh, goes into the basin. And they can offer increased residence time and greater infiltration, thereby decreasing nutrient load into the watershed. Uh, then there are a bunch of other benefits, uh, like offering uh, more habitat for increased biodiversity or uh, offering places for nice uh, scenic recreational opportunities. So just some final thoughts related to what I've discussed here. Nobody really thinks that we're going to do a complete 180 and reestablish the native landscape that was in Ohio. We do, however, think that we can take some steps to reverse some of the impacts that we have had on the region and potentially improve our soil and water in the Western Lake Erie Basin in the process. Focusing on implementing practices that will build soil health metrics such as soil organic matter and aggregate stability can help us improve water quality in the region while making our farms more sustainable in the future. We can also look at the restoration of natural environments such as forests and wetlands, which we know provide tremendous ecological services to the environment. Uh, the H2 Ohio program that is currently available and being implemented in the state has really taken aim at increasing the number of naturally restored and man-made wetlands that ex uh, exist across the Western Lake Erie Basin. And there are a number of new wetlands either installed or planned for installation across the region. So I'm going to leave you with that, and I will pass it off to Bridget for the next segment. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, Matt. I will take over screen sharing right now. All right, hello. My name is Bridget Moneymaker. Um, I'm going to be delving in to Lake Erie limnology and current water quality conditions. I'm also a water quality associate and I cover Auglaize and Mercer in Allen County. So a little bit of an overview, like I mentioned, we're gonna get into some of the limnology of the Great Lakes. Uh, limnology is also known as the study of inland aquatic systems. So lakes, rivers, ponds, et cetera. Uh, specifically, we're gonna delve into the Western Lake Erie Basin, um, uh, current water quality issues, and then some future watershed uh, approaches to management and regulation. Uh, to start off at the beginning, what is a watershed? So a watershed is an area of land that all drains to a common point. So if you think of the watershed as sort of a depression in the land, if you dropped water anywhere in that area, it would still flow to the same point. So watershed, basin, catchment, they're all pretty much used interchangeably. Uh, and as we'll see later, there can also be sort of a Russian doll situation where multiple smaller watersheds can be nested within larger ones. So how are watersheds organized? Watersheds are organized by their hydrologic unit codes and they're pronounced hook. And they're mainly used for classification. No one's gonna ask you what your hook is. I mean, I might, but we'll get there later. <laughs> um, so the number of numbers in the hook is the same as its level. So a hook 12, which we'll get into, has 12 numbers, um, which is the smallest level, but we need to back up a little bit just to show the bigger picture before we start uh, getting into those hook 12s in the Great Lakes. So the entire U.S. is broken to roughly 21 major geographic hydrologic, unit, hydrologic units, or HUC-2s. And here we are located in the Great Lakes region, um, which is a HUC-2 and a 04. And so since the numbers keep increasing in this region, any watershed that starts with a 04, you can automatically know that that is going to be in the Great Lakes region. So here's a better picture of that entire Great Lakes watershed. Um, which of course contains the Great Lakes, the largest system of freshwater 
in the world, not only one of the most ecological diverse areas, but also the world's third largest regional economy. It's about six quadrillion gallons of water. Um, I think it, uh, to explain that better, it would cover the entire contigu contiguous US in about 10 feet of water if it was spread out evenly among the states. Uh, as we now narrow down this massive watershed, you can see that each lake basically has its own watershed. And then there is Lake Erie there at the bottom in yellow. So the Lake Erie watershed alone has about a third the population of the total population of the Great Lakes watershed, about 12 million people. So it's actually the second smallest lake, but it's the smallest by volume. It's also the shallowest, the southernest, the warmest, and the shortest retention. Um, as Matt mentioned, the fertile soils and intense ag presence has exposed Lake Erie to the greatest effects of both urbanization and agriculture. Um, so the bathymetry uh, of the lake, um, it's a depth. Um, the lake itself is actually, has three primary basins, west, central, and eastern. So within this already extremely shallow lake, the western basin, which we're gonna be focusing on, is also the shallowest. It has an average depth of only 24 feet. And then just like the lake itself, Lake Erie's watersheds are separated into actually, into actually four sub-basins, um, including that western basin that drains that, into that extremely shallow portion. And this sub-basin is what we are going to be concentrating most of our attention on today. So narrowing down that watershed a little bit, we're gonna kind of get into that nitty gritty um, just to explain some of the context of some of these management practices later. So starting with the entire Western Lake Erie Basin on the left, um, I'm gonna zoom into the Huck 12 letter and then demonstrate the scale of those. So within the Western Lake Erie Basin, there are several sub basins. So here as the entire Western Lake Erie Basin, and I've circled the Auglaise watershed, which is a Huck 8. Uh, and then on the right, there is um, that same watershed broken into that watershed's sub watersheds. And within there, um, I've highlighted the upper Little Auglaes River watershed, a Huck 10. And within that watershed, there are four additional sub watersheds, and these are our Huck 12s. And specifically, I want to point out this Kyle Prairie Creek Huck 12 here at the bottom of this watershed. And when I mean bottom, I actually mean the top because that is the headwaters because these are draining north. Just to demonstrate the scale of some of these Huck 12s, this is that Kyle Perry Creek um, basin overlaid on a Google map. So you can see just how small some of these can be. That entire area could be compromised of just a handful of producers. So this small scale approach allows us to implement some of these on-farm research trials and practices and monitoring projects where we can utilize these smaller watershed boundaries to really get a better picture of what's going on in this entire area and kind of scale that up further nutrient-wise upstream. So like I mentioned before, the Huck numbers are more for technical classification, um, but you can learn what your own Huck 12 is. Um, so then you would be easily able to scale that watershed back up in size by following the numbers. So this, um, this for Wolf Ditch Watershed, which is another Huck 12 in that upper Little Auglaise River watershed, you can kind of see that the numbers um, keep adding up till you get to that 12. And like I said, no one's going to ask you what your Huck 12 is, um, but it is um, advisable to maybe just become familiar with uh, your local watershed, whether you want to get involved with a um, citizen action group or you just want to be able to look into your own creek in your backyard and see where that's draining to and maybe uh, your own place in this larger region. And lucky for everyone, uh, our brand new water quality extension website um, we're still adding on to it, so it's kind of the bare minimum right now, but we do have on our menu um, something called Watershed Resources, which right now will bring you to the Find Your Watershed Portal by the EPA, um, where all you have to do is enter your address, coordinates. Uh, you can even just zoom in, pan around to a location, and it will give you your Huck 12. So for this, this example, I put in Wapakoneta, Ohio, which is the OSU Extension uh, office in Auglaise County, where I'm currently located. So it says I'm in the dry run Huck 12. It gives me that larger number. So you can just Google that number and you can find some reports, um, uh, anything you wanna know about any studies that have been done using that Huck number. And then some basic information on impairments, current management plans. So I definitely encourage everyone to look into their own watershed um, and potentially see where you are located in the Western Lake Erie Basin and maybe what your impact is on some of these smaller watersheds. So bringing it back to these water quality issues, um, dialing back a little bit. Um, 
some of you may be familiar with uh, the problems in Lake Erie really started to become a larger issue in the 60s, where it was basically a free for all in terms of dumping pollutants from all sectors just directly into the lake. And this is that famous photo of when the Cuyahoga River fire and this uh, kind of prompted a new era of um, conservation, which eventually led to the Clean Water Act of 1972 uh, passing, which basically regulated those pollutions. And it was extremely successful. Uh, Lake Erie experienced roughly a 60% reduction phosphorus loading alone uh, up until roughly like the late 90s, which brings us to our current problem, harmful algal blooms. So in recent years, compounding issues such as human activity, warmer weather, uh, more extreme precipitation, and in addition to more frequent participation events, um, has caused an increase in harmful algal blooms, also known colloquially as HABs, where increases of nutrients can cause dead zones in Lake Erie. So we're probably all familiar with these high def photos of green sludge in the lake. Um, they're very, um, they start becoming popular, uh, and I guess viral when the lake experiences those algal events. So basically what happens during a harmful algal bloom is that uh, those nutrients enter the watershed, make their way to Lake Erie, where they basically start off a chain of events. The algae start to grow due to all those nutrients. Um, they can actually cover the entire surface of the lake. And when they're thick enough to block sunlight and cut off some of those aquatic plants from photosynthesis, they start to die. The algae also starts to die and the combined bacterial decomposition of the plants and the algae use up the oxygen in the water <clears throat> through cellular respiration. And when that dissolved oxygen reduces dramatically, it cuts off the rest of the animals, causing them to die off as well. And you have those large scale fish dies. So the price of harmful algal blooms, um, not only are these events deadly to the lake itself, uh, but it also disrupts a multi-billion dollar economy, including a globally recognized freshwater fishing and birding industry. Not to mention the revenue loss to decreased tourism, property values, and the health impacts of the people who rec rely on that watershed for their drinking water, such as Toledo. So in order to tackle uh, the increase in HABs over the years and just overall nutrient uh, excess nutrient runoff in the watershed, the Western Lake Erie is highlighted as one of the key players for its contribution to Lake Erie's water quality. The watershed is nearly 80% ag and drains about 7 million acres across the tri-state area. So this area is where me and the rest of my water quality associates are located with OSU Extension to address that excess nutrient runoff in the basin. And we are here to uh, directly assist farmers to implement conservation practices. So if you're interested in addressing water quality in your production, here's just a little plug for our team. Um, that was created to literally address these issues in the watershed on the ground and to work directly with producers on their own land. So how are we addressing these nutrients today? So for my last section, I'm going to briefly go over two documents that provide some watershed scale research backed insight on nutrient loading in the watershed and how we can better address the issue uh, moving forward. So the 2020 Nutrient Mass Balance Report, this report comes out every two years and its purpose is to assign nitrogen phosphorus loads to specific watersheds and identify contributing source categories such as ag, wastewater and home sewage treatment system. Uh, so the nutrient loading, nutrient loading data provides a better insight into determining the best course of action for nutrient reduction. And it does so on the sub watershed level um, and it actually targets specifically the Maumee River Basin, which I will delve into. So it's a little confusing because they kind of like have the same shape, the Maumee River Basin and the Western Lake Erie Basin. But the Maumee River Basin is actually a subsection of the Western Lake Erie Basin. Sometimes those larger drainage basins are delineated into several sub basins um, just to give a better, uh, more targeted approach. And so this entire chunk of the Western Lake Erie Basin is referred to as the Maumee Mom River Basin. Um, and then follows the Maumee River through uh, um, sort of the eastern side of Indiana there all the way to Lake Erie. So the Maumee River Basin is actually the largest drainage basin of any river system in the whole Great Lakes watershed. Um, it's about 4.2 million acres and it has a high concentration of ag use as well and was ranked highest for overall 
total nutrient load into Lake Erie. So a summary of the support um, basically notes that there are several factors that influence nutrient loading and that these individual factors help distinguish the total nutrient load from a watershed in addition to the breakdown of sources. So the nine total watersheds uh, varied both in total loads contributed relative to, this, to their size and the role of their sources. So understanding these differences will help inform future decisions as nutrient reduction efforts are pursued to meet the goals of some of those um, international and national agreements for Lake Erie. Um, so that report is online. It's pretty easy to just scroll through and look at some of the figures that basically go through those nine watersheds specifically and kind of give you a breakdown on what those differences are. Um, but it helps us in terms of being able to use that watershed level approach um, for targeted management. So last but not least, the 2019 Domestic Action Plan. So this is another science-based plan for ag BMPs and also includes additional support for programs um, such as H2 Ohio and integrated watershed management at the local level. Again, specifically looking at the Maumee River Basin. Again, the Maumee has been identified as a top priority area in Ohio for excess nutrients. Um, specifically, the springtime nutrient loading has been identified as the most critical uh, to reduce the occurrence of HAPs in Lake Erie. And the figure on the right shows that nearly 88% of mommy's phosphorus load is from non-point sources such as agriculture. So like I said, the mommy was identified as being a priority tributary to reduce nutrient loading. And that specific task is uh, underway by 2025. And they expect a 40% reduction from 2008 baseline levels. An additional thing this report does is that it distributes those Maumee River springtime loads to the sub-watershed levels, um, HUC 12s, those yields using the contributing area of the HUC 12 watershed. So again, a finer scale geographic distribution of the total phosphorus load from various sources within the Maumee watershed and further divided by landscape source. So this will enable local governments, watershed organizations, and producers to implement actions that are meaningful in terms of field and instrument projects, local land management decisions, and improved production projections, so tailoring of specific practices to conditions. And as you can see, it's a little hard without being able to zoom in. You can kind of see those Huck 12s in terms of their phosphorus yield. And you, that area under Allen County where Lima is, which is a more urban area, you can tell has a much smaller implication for those phosphorus loads. But you're, by breaking it up into those small Huck 12s, you can, like I said, um, implement those targeted practices and be able to see the small scale changes that will eventually add up to hopefully to that 40% reduction by 2025. Uh, so one example of this finer scale, coming back to the upper little Auglaise watershed from earlier, I circled the dry fork Huck 12, which was identified through that domestic action plan as having a high phosphorus yield and also this huck has a drinking water impairment for nitrates and cyanotoxins. So with this information, we were able to implement a project targeting monitoring and sampling of this entire larger watershed to hopefully reduce nutrient loading and lessen the pressure on drinking on the drinking water plant there. Uh, and additionally use this smaller scale approach to hopefully measure BMP effectiveness in the area and kind of give um, our resources a better targeted area to where um, might need the most uh, monetary support. So that is a the behind the watershed there that is actually the drinking water intake that it is installed on. And you can see in the summer, they get intense algal growths. Um, and sometimes the city of Delphis where it is located actually has a hard time filling their drinking water reservoir. So we've implemented that project there, not only for the human aspects, but also to be able to map that watershed for nutrient loading and see if we can help uh, that area achieve some of those targeted reductions. So in summary, uh, Lake Erie's geographic characteristics make it even more susceptible to those, to those eutrophication issues. And specifically in the Western Lake Erie Basin uh, is a research-based targeted area for that nutrient reduction. And then additionally, ag best management practices really need to be ta tailored to critical areas um, identified as having both high nutrient loading and the greatest potential water quality benefits. So those sub-basins and HUC-12s, where you can really narrow it down to see that targeted um, approach. And then including those targeted watershed approaches that lead to better measure of BMP effectiveness. And like I said before, better allocation of our limited monetary resources. So with that, I will pass it over to 
Bone Fisher to wrap up his section. Okay. Thank you, Bridget. Well, thanks, Matt and Bridget. Both of you appreciate your information and presentations up to this point. As Bridget mentioned, my name is Bowden Fisher. I'm a water quality associate with Extension as well, and I primarily cover the Blanchard watershed. Um, so the counties uh, listed there, Putnam, Hancock, and Hardin counties is where I primarily work. And, you know, I think having some background on our soils and our uh, water quality history will lend itself well to this last presentation today in which I'm going to discuss a little bit about what management uh, may look like going into the future um, and some practices and concepts you can consider when thinking about your own land management or watershed planning or whatever the case may be. But kind of want to take a look forward um, as well as a look at what's currently happening uh, in our region. So this is the direction that we're going to take throughout this presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about managing water at different scales, managing soil at different scales, and then how those two intersect. As we all know, it's hard to manage one without the other uh, in a lot of ways. So we'll cover um, some aspects of both of those. So starting with managing water. Uh, we're going to start a little bit, zoom back out, and uh, Bridget and Matt have both done this well, and I want to try to do so as well. So we're going to look a little bit at a societal scale, how we're managing water, and then a little bit at a watershed scale and at a field scale. So um, TMDL, you may or may not have heard the term, but that is something that is kind of a hot topic right now. Uh, so we wanted to just give a little bit of an update there. I highly recommend you go to Ohio EPA's website for more in-depth information. This is just uh, an overview. Um, but basically, a TMDL is a total maximum daily load. And this is a large and ongoing adaptive management process uh, that is undertaken for a watershed. Um, specifically, though, I'm referencing what's been began undertaking this year is a TMDL for Western Lake Erie. So the Western Lake Erie Basin of the open waters of Lake Erie, as you see designated in green on the map, three segments of the uh, lake's water body have been designated as impaired. And so under the um, uh, leadership of Ohio EPA, they're developing a TMDL for the contributing watershed area of particularly the Maumee watershed. So that's what is included in this uh, current total maximum daily load uh, process. and. Um, you can see here that it, it addresses the Western shoreline, the open waters and the islands shoreline. But what's different about this TMDL than others that Ohio EPA has done is that it is a far field TMDL, which means that the impairments uh, to the water body are not local in the sense that they are contributed locally, but they're far field in the sense that they happen farther upstream. A lot of the contributions happen farther upstream, so it's not as localized as past TMDLs. For example, there's been a TMDL done in the Blanchard in the past, as well as the Auglaise, and both of those address near field targets or targets that happen within that specific uh, watershed. So it is a little bit different. And the impact of this is yet to be seen in the sense that I want to clarify that a TMDL is not regulatory in and of itself. So um, that is the, the most important thing to clarify is that a TMDL is not regulatory, but it does set forth uh, goals and mitigation options uh, that can be set forth and followed. So those are a couple of important distinctions about this process. A little more uh, before we move on, the current status of that process, there's five steps, steps that have been designated, and we are currently in the third phase. It's a loading analysis plan. So this kind of outlines a plan for the TMDL process. It's used to set pollutant targets and address impairments within the defined uh, watershed area. And step four, we'll look more at um, the results of the pollutant load distribution um, and look at all the sources and uh, to kind of designate uh, impairments across to the contributing sources. So that's the next step, and then there'll be an official draft. So we are partway through. And if you look, as I mentioned, uh, the difference between near field and far field, um, these are some of the near field TMDLs and where they stand in the process. Uh, so in green, they're also in step three. Uh, blue has already been completed, and this is an adaptive process. So these blue hatched um, segments or watersheds are already past their first cycle, and they're renewing the process or looking at how well uh, we have reached goals uh, that were set forth in the initial TMDL. So that's where we stand at the moment. And um, one other thing I wanted to point out 
is these are the impairments specifically. You saw the map, but these are the impairments associated with each of those geographic regions that are being addressed in the TMDL. So the Western uh, Basin, uh, you can look at all of these individually. And again, Ohio EPA has a specific website for this project itself. So that's a very informative place. And they also look for public input. So it's a public process and you can give input to this process and plan. So we've looked a little bit at societal or regional scale. Uh, we're going to scale down a little bit now and look at a watershed scale. This, these um, plans we're going to talk about are actually do take place on the HUC-12 scale, which you're now familiar with after Bridget's uh, good explanation there. And basically, a non-point source implementation strategy is a watershed, watershed scale management uh, plan uh, that addresses impairments in a specific uh, hydrologic unit. So it lists impairments, it lists critical areas that can be most targeted uh, to make the biggest impact to address those impairments or mitigate future impairments. And it can, um, it it's also involves stakeholder input as well. So it's supposed to be uh, using local interest and input into these plans to make uh, strategies going forward to mitigate impairments. So some of the projects that can be included in these are listed on the left. Uh, urban and sediment nutrient reduction uh, projects, altering stream and habitat restoration, for example, in agricultural ditches, um, agricultural non-point source reductions. This can be agricultural best management practices, whether that be uh, deep placement of phosphorus, soil testing, cover crops, those sort of things can be included. And then high quality waters protection for those water bodies that are in uh, considered pristine condition. So these are some of the things that can be addressed in these implementation strategies. And I wanted to point out this map. Uh, it's probably updated now, but on Ohio EPA website, you can also look at this map. And these are where plans have been completed already or are in the process. So you can see it's not necessarily a new thing that's been happening for quite a while, um, but it's going to continue to be important going forward. And I'll talk about um, why that is. So these are also called, as I talked, they're NPS, IS plans, but they could also be called nine element plans. And that's because the planning process includes nine specific elements that have to be addressed. Uh, some of the things that are taken into account in these plans is if there is, for example, a TMDL or a biological assessment of a water body that has been completed, uh, you can use that within the planning process. It also takes land use data, for example, how much of the uh, land in a watershed is urban, how much is row crop production, how much is pasture, how much is forest land, that sort of thing is taken into consideration, as well as the monitoring capabilities within that watershed. So some areas have continuous water quality monitoring stations, and that can impact your ability um, to actually uh, monitor the progress on a project or its impacts on the water body. So these are a couple things that are included in a, a nine element plan. But one of the one of the things that is important about this is it really prioritizes a watershed for funding. So when a grant opportunities come up, whether that be a EPA 319 grant or whether that be a Great Lakes restoration grant, uh, these areas that do have these plans in place can be prioritized for funding. And sometimes it's required that these plans are in place. So it's important that you can get stakeholder input and landowner input as to what is actually possible in an area, what's actually of interest in an area, and to move forward with that in this planning process. So now we'll scale down even a little farther and look at edge of field management of water. Okay, we've looked at societal water management, uh, wa local water management. Now we'll look a little bit at edge of field management. I'm just going to cover a couple concepts. Uh, we could go, we could talk about this a long time. Uh, there are a lot of things that are on the rise in the future um, for land management, but edge of field management is a um, current and future way to manage water. You can see here on the left-hand side, this is an edge of field monitoring station. There's quite a few of these in the region. Actually, if you look at the map on the right, this um, this points out, and this map is actually outdated. So the, some of these sites have moved. Uh, there are more than is listed here now actually in the region, but these are edge of field sites throughout Northwest and the whole state of Ohio and uh, where there is continuous monitoring of water quality. And this is to look at different management practices and how they impact water at the edge of field. Now, the part of this is also uh, questioning whether we can scale this up. So what you see at the edge of field um, is not always consistent, but that's why it's replicated so many times to see uh, what, we, what might be the net impacts of uh, management of water and soil. So 
a couple of practices now that you can look at uh, as a landowner, as a watershed planner, uh, ways we can manage water. We know from Matt's uh, conversation that um, the Western Lake Erie Basin is artificially drained quite heavily. And that's for good reason, of course, for agricultural production, we need uh, land that is not underwater. And even uh, from on a seasonal basis, we need um, during the growing season land that is well drained to effectively grow crops. And we know that. And uh, so tile drainage, subsurface artificial drainage is prevalent in the area. In fact, if you look back at the previous slide, um, based on these estimates, most of the counties in Northwest Ohio have 50 to 80% of ground that is tile drained. So that's pretty significant in terms of the overall uh, land use and uh, has great impacts on water quality downstream as well. So subsurface drainage traditionally can serve as a great conduit for water as that is the point of it to remove water from our cropping system. It also serves as a great conduit for nutrients and sediment. So conservation drainage is a newer term that is applied to uh, conventional subsurface drainage and conservation drainage encapsulates a lot of different practices that can be utilized in coordination with subsurface drainage um, to hopefully mitigate impacts at the uh, edge of field and downstream. So I, I won't go into depth on a lot of these, but uh, in the left, for example, drainage water recycling is a concept. It's actually, there were three sites in Northwest Ohio actually that were evaluated for this where uh, in times of the season where water is in excess and we're getting a lot of tile flow that water is routed to a reservoir, or in some cases, a wetland and a reservoir. And then in times of the season uh, where water is in deficit, it can be pumped back into the system via the subsurface tile drainage and utilized by the crop. So this is one concept. It's not as prevalent in our area necessarily, but this is used for with sub-irrigation as well as overhead irrigation. So that's one concept that may be up and coming. Um, and you can look at uh, NRCS practices to see if that's applicable for your area. Another concept is a saturated buffer, and I'll leave that for a later slide, but you see that in the top right here, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the baseline practices that is used in coordination with a lot of other conservation drainage practices is a drainage control structure. And uh, I'll go ahead and talk about that here in the next moment. So a drainage control structure, the intent of it is basically to manipulate the water table level at different times of the season. So in order to manage our water, um, you know, the tile, you look in the left photo here, this is the design of conventional tile drainage, right, is to get the water table to lower in the field uh, so that it's not uh, negatively impacting your crops. So looking at this tile line, um, your water table level is always going to lower to that tile line or lower. Um, ultimately, that's the goal of it. Uh, with a drainage control structure, the intent is to raise the water table level at times of year where we do not need as much uh, water to be leaving the system. So oftentimes this is used to, uh, you use free flowing tile drainage when you're about to do field work, such as in the harvest or in uh, field preparation and planting. And then during the growing season, you raise the water table level and you also do that over the winter so that excess water is not always flowing through the tile. On the right hand side, you see a picture of what that looks like inside these control boxes. And basically there are uh, stop boards that are placed on top of one another, and that is setting the height of your water table. So um, this, and this of course, is just to impact the tile drainage. Of course, you're going to have natural drainage of water around the tile system, um, but this is a big impact and can specifically address a lot of nitrogen concerns. These are being funded in multiple ways, and that's why I included this, is this, this is kind of the future, we think, uh, in the sense that H2 Ohio funds this, USDA and RCS funds this practice, and it's growing in popularity um, as an edge of field practice to manage water. So this is one concept you can think about. And the one other fact with that, and this, this on the right-hand side, this is an automated system. So there are, these are few and far between right now. But in the future, this may be a bit more of an adaptive management strategy where uh, you can set the water table level uh, remotely. And uh, this is Bluetooth controlled, so you can um, do this without doing any manual removal or addition of boards within the system. So buffers, these are not new, but there is a concept within it that's new and they're being utilized in different ways. So I thought I would address this as well. Uh, buffers 
you know, a lot of times to uh, manage erosion, uh, to direct uh, impact to stream or a ditch. Uh, on the left here, though, uh, this is a little uh, more complicated than a traditional buffer. Actually, this is a hay buffer. So ODA has funded these in the past. Um, I don't think it's currently open for enrollment, but this is a, an addition or an enhancement to traditional buffers in the fact that you're removing nutrients from the system because this buffer is used for hay production. So you're getting a crop off of this, not just a grassy area or a riparian area. So there's added benefit there in removing nutrients from a system. One other concept, as I mentioned before, is a saturated buffer. So this allows a conventional outlet here you see on the left, uh, tile outlet to the directly to the stream or ditch. In a saturated buffer, you also have a distribution pipe in a lateral setting that allows more natural percolation of the water to the stream bank um, in times where that is feasible. You do have an overflow discharge, so you're not holding back water when you really need to get rid of it. But this is another uh, thing that is up and coming. It's actually being tested. I think there's a published paper out in uh, from Mercer County where this has been tested, so something to look at there. So it's hard to address water management in Northwest Ohio without looking at soil management as well, as we all know. And uh, whatever you think about your soil, how good or bad it is, whatever you think about its age and origin, and we're kind of stuck with what we have um, in, in most cases. So we're learning to widen our view of soil and its various properties, such as biological components, chemical fertility, physical structure. So we're, we're looking at all types of different things now as we move forward. You may have seen seen uh, quite a few seminars this year about soil health. Ohio State uh, has done some work with that as well, and we host a series. Um, but there are uh, quite a few views looking at how to adaptively manage our soil. When we're talking about water quality, though, um, managing our soil in the future, this is nothing new to us, but I wanted to point out that the tri-state fertilizer recommendations have been updated. So this is kind of futuristic in the sense that what we've known is changing a little bit. So um, looking forward, how we manage nutrients in our soil, uh, our rates, our timing, our sources, our placement, that all fits in with 4R nutrient management and how we can impact, um, believe we can impact water quality. This fertilizer calculator is available through Ohio State and that uh, helps make sure that your soil test, when you get your soil test results, that um, you can input those and your field uh, management preferences to get an output that is uh, synonymous with tri-state recommendations. So that is Ohio State's recommendation for fertility management, the chemical side of managing your soil for water quality. And just further along with that is, our hope is to maximize your return as well as minimize edge of field losses. So following the tri-state framework for phosphorus management here on the right, um, taking a heed of your soil tests and then um, and not applying phosphorus when it's unnecessary agronomically, and then also taking into consideration Ohio data for nitrogen management in corn. So those are a couple ways to look at your nutrient management to impact water quality. Another thing we've all heard a lot about, which is different than um, recent years uh, of how we apply phosphorus, deep placement of phosphorus is, uh, it's already here, but it's also an up and coming practice in the sense that it's not widely adopted in a lot of cases. So this is these uh, images here from a fact sheet that we can provide you uh, through Ohio State Extension. But this shows different equipment capacities that have developed over the years and requirements of uh, like horsepower requirements, things like that for applying phosphorus uh, subsurface. Okay. Traditionally, we have broadcast and incorporate. That's nothing new. But then we have injection placement, deep rip and placement, zone mixing. So there are quite a few options now for applying phosphorus below the surface. And this is a direction we see. Uh, our region headed. And that's also an H2 Ohio funded practice and an NRCS funded practice. So it's really something that we think we can take advantage of going into the future. Managing erosion, um, we see higher rates of adoption of cover crop usage and other practices to try to minimize erosion. This is a historical practice as well. So, um, but again, we're coming back to some of the older things and uh, looking at how we can adaptively manage our soils in that way. So uh, this is a cereal rye cover crop on the right, one of the best uh, species for managing erosion and also for uptake of nitrate. So those are a couple things we can look at um, into the future as well and trying to solidify our species selection and our system for cover cropping. So, And this is, goes back to what I had mentioned in the beginning a little bit um, 
about the different components of soil health. This is something we look at. These are a few of the concepts that NRCS mentions in looking at soil health or some principles for good soil health is maintaining soil cover, minimizing disturbance of the soil, uh, maintaining living roots, and maximizing biodiversity of your cropping system. So those are a couple of concepts we look at that uh, we believe will help to increase uh, soil health, both the physical, chemical, and biological components of that. So this is another direction we see things going um, in the future. So finally, trying to bring these concepts together for you, uh, the intersection of soil and water. We know that they are intersect, that they intersect and that they uh, impact one another quite heavily. And in this picture here, I wanted to, I'm going to talk a little bit about different scales of nutrient loss risk and mitigation of that. Um, but basically, we need to think about this. I think this image really shows it well. It's from Ohio State's BMP website. But nutrient loss risk has to take into consideration source and transport of nutrient, right? If we have a lot of phosphorus, but it's sitting inside a building somewhere, there's really no risk of it um, being lost to a stream. Likewise, if there's a lot of uh, rain or direct conduit to transport nutrients, but there's no nutrient, then there's no loss risk for the nutrients. So we have to think of these in tandem. And that's another uh, concept to consider when we look at um, our loss risks. So I'm going to start with uh, assessing our risk of loss, looking at nitrogen a little bit. So if you look at this map, this is um, talks about the natural drainage classes of soil. Okay, so if you look at this map here, Northwest Ohio, talking about exactly what Matt was talking about in our soil types, um, we really see that naturally we have very poorly to moderately well-drained soils, but mostly in the poorly drained categories. So if this is the case, you know, why do we see a high risk of nitrate leaching, for example? If the soil is not going, if there's a high residency of water in the soil, why are we worried about the, the water transporting nutrients uh, if it's not, if it's going to take a long time for the water to get anywhere? Well, as you may have guessed, uh, subsurface drainage changes that as we've already looked at. But I wanted to point this out in that uh, NRCS, for example, when they look at nutrient loss risk of, of a certain parcel of land, uh, there's natural categories of loss risk based on your soil type and your annual rainfall and your seasonal rainfall. And those are classified into four categories of risk. But if you have subsurface systematic tile drainage, your drainage class automatically goes to the highest risk category. So even though naturally we might not see a high risk for nitrate leaching to the waterways in our area, that is the case since most of our land is tile drained. So that's one way to assess your risk for nutrient loss, specifically for nitrogen. Uh, when we talk about phosphorus, uh, soil tests are a good way to screen your fields, for example. And this is also outlined in um, NRCS 590 that has been renewed this year, but also revised. Um, your soil test phosphorus uh, is related to your risk of phosphorus loss, at least the dissolved reactive phosphorus por portion. So that's the portion that um, is freely soluble in the water. And so you look at, the, primarily we're looking at this blue line. Um, there's four different categories again for risk. And really, after you reach the agronomic range of uh, phosphorus, your risk increases significantly, especially when we get up into that um, 120 range is where we really start to see a higher risk for uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus losses. And that's not even taking into account the considerations of management practices. So this can be higher or lower based on your situation. But this is one way to screen your land to see you know, where you might uh, focus some of your efforts. OK, so in this in this. Uh, these dashed lines talk about the tri-state recommendations. And if we're within this range, we see a much lower risk of yield loss as well as um, nutrient loss compared to um, below for, for yield loss or above this range for nutrient loss to the environment. So these are a couple of things to consider as well. Another direction we see ourselves going, um, and hopefully our team will be able to do a little bit of work with this, is field scale scenario assessment. So NRCS has uh, approved two tools for use uh, on Field Ohio and the nutrient tracking tool are two uh, field based or field scenario based systems that can look at management practices and kind of uh, estimate your losses. And these are based on um, field scale experiments and trials with monitoring that um, 
and uses that to make models of what you might anticipate to lose in a field specific scenario. So if you're looking at, you know, how can I change my management practices um, to possibly impact nutrient loss risk? This, these would be a couple of tools that um, professionals could run on your different scenarios to hopefully impact that or let you see some options. So this is the direction we see ourselves going again on a field scale uh, that might be of use to landowners. When we look a little bit larger at the landscape scale, modeling has really become a important aspect of how we plan for our watershed management. So uh, this is from a study by Dr. Jay Martin and many others uh, that looked at uh, modeling different management practices bundled together across the Maumee Basin or across the Western Lake Erie Basin to see, based on what we know from field results, if there was a certain level of adoption of specific practices, would we reach our phosphorus reduction goals to Lake Erie? And in many cases, it was no. And so even in this specific scenario here, based on the models, we believe that we would reach a total phosphorus reduction goal, but not the dissolved react reactive phosphorus goal. So I encourage you to look at this. Um, if you look at the knowledge exchange on OSU's website, you can find this, uh, but there's some good resources out there. But this again is another direction we see ourselves going. There's a lot of modeling being done because the Maumee Basin is, as Bridget mentioned, is so large, uh, you cannot do all manual assessment. So you have to look at some modeling aspects of this based on the smaller scale assessments. And this is the direction we see things going as well to help us look at where we prioritize funding, to help us look at where we prioritize um, our practices. And finally, this is a tool that specific that our team, but specifically Matt has worked a lot with is the agricultural conservation fr planning framework. And this can be used by watershed planners or soil and water or whoever um, to, to have conversations with interested producers about what your land may allow in terms of what would be a suitable practice structurally, a structural practice um, that could impact water quality. So that could be grass waterway, that could be a water and sediment uh, control basin, that could be drainage water management, and this is based on topography, soil type, and things of that sort. So this ACPF framework is another direction uh, that's gaining a lot of steam and that we could see being utilized in the future for watershed planning. And so hopefully that gives you a little idea of where we're at and where we're going and some of the things that you may want to keep an eye out for in the future as a landowner or a watershed planner or just an interested public person. So we appreciate your time and I think we're gonna open it up for questions. So I will turn it back over to Jordan. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks to each of our speakers. I think we had a three really good presentations today. So I would encourage you if you have questions to use the Q and A section so we can look at those and get those answered. Um, just want to bring your attention to a couple of things that you're going to be seeing when you close out of this webinar, you will get a uh, pop-up link that you can uh, put your email in to sign up for updates from our team. Um, those will come periodically. Uh, we'll try not to overload your inbox. So just a, a few updates here and there. And then secondly, tomorrow or in the next couple of days, you'll receive a, uh, another email about a survey on our program. And uh, the only way for us to get better and to improve our uh, presentations and understand what you guys want to hear from us is if you can fill out those surveys. Uh, those will be very valuable as we go forward, uh, creating new programs in the future. Uh, with that, um, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. so. If you have them, please get them into the Q&A or into the chat function. Again, I want to thank everybody that attended our program. And also, um, there were a number of links put in the chat throughout. So you can check that out um, just from some of the different resources and websites that our speakers talked about today. Also, if you missed any of our prior videos, and this one will also be posted on the OSU Agronomic Crops YouTube page. Um, and along with our videos, there's a number of other really uh, informa infor, uh, good videos from, from this winter and the programming that we've done uh, with OSU Extension over the last, really over the last year as we've been in a virtual environment. Thanks for that, Jordan. I think you covered everything. We, we do have a question that came in with the Q&A here. Um, from Ralph, it says, is there a tool for control of floating algae outside of chemicals? 
Is there a need for doing so for all water watersheds across Ohio? I'm assuming uh, it's referring to maybe like the physical removal of algae from the surface of the lake. Oh, Bowden, you want to go for it? Oh, you were just clicking live to answer. <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just addre uh, addressing it. No, go ahead, Bridget. I, yeah. I know there, this is an active area of research. I know uh, our director. I actually, I'm not familiar with any physical uh, removal of algae on the lake on Lake Erie surface. Um, uh, I'm kind of new to the area in general, so I'm not sure if that's something that people uh, are aware of happens or Bowden, did you uh, say that they're currently researching it? I believe there's work at OSU where they're looking at ozone even, for example, but that's a, that's a beginning, very beginning stages of looking at that. But yeah, there, this is an active area of research of how you can control the algae once it's there, uh, as well as trying to control the source and transport. That's a great question though. And there is, I don't believe, any consensus at the time. Hmm. I would check maybe with Stone Lab. Um, they have a lot of resources um, in terms of Lake Erie, um, other um, uh, research areas, because they're like directly on the lake. And we unfortunately haven't been able to work with them as much this year just because of uh, keeping our distance. But hopefully we'll be able to partner with them in the future. I also see that he, he mentioned other watersheds and there are some um, ongoing research down around the Ohio River area as well, um, Southwest Ohio. Maybe they don't get in the news as often, but they, they have some of the same challenges that we do up here. So there's also some research being conducted down in that area. Uh, we got another question here from Greg. It says, are there any P levels in the water that are considered excessive? I know uh, natural phosphorus, I think, is somewhere um, less than 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. Um, so there's always like naturally occurring phosphorus. And it, it, yeah, I think um, like specifically, I don't know if like there's a 10 parts per million for nitrate. I don't know if there's anything similar, Bridget, for phosphorus in terms of drinking water. But I know a lot of the times the what we look at for phosphorus levels is the the numbers that have been set uh, in the in the water quality agreement. So we look at the concentration of, of phosphorus in the water in, in regards to that. So we would consider not necessarily excessive, but, you know, that's the number we often look at in trying to reach the goals, I guess, that have been set um, that they believe will impact or mitigate um, harmful algal blooms. So that's, those are kind of the thresholds uh, that we most often talk about. And for nitrates, it's 10 parts per million, um, 10 parts per million, anything in excess of that is considered too high. And then let me know the higher you get, it, it becomes downright poisonous. Okay, and it looks like uh, Ralph circled back to his prior question. He was referencing reactive oxygen species to turn off photosynthesis. Um, it seems like we've heard little bits and pieces about that um, just beginning in some areas here in Ohio. And um, so I think there will be more to come on that, hopefully in the next year or a couple of years. And our uh, water quality uh, director, Heather Raymond, she's worked with the EPA for almost a decade. She has a um, uh, much more technical background in terms of harmful algal blooms. Um, so we can probably uh, reach out to her for that information. Or if you're interested, you can go to the, the baseline water quality initiative OSC website, and there is a box there. Okay, with that, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So um, again, we appreciate everybody attending today. And if you have uh, further questions or would like to reach out to, to one of the Water Quality Extension Associates, um, our information is on the website. Um, make sure and, and reach out to us with an email and, and we'd love to get in touch with you and, and learn more about uh, your concerns or what your uh, hopes are for your watersheds and the areas that you guys live in and, and operate your uh, businesses and farms in. So thanks for attending everyone.